three. Yummy like a gummy bear. It's the internet, you're busy, let's do this for March 13th, 2024, for the next hour or so. Let me help you sort through the world of gaming on Game Mess Mornings Live with me, Jeff Grubb. Today we figure out if Mega Man is important, and don't believe the propaganda about flying bugs in Helldivers 2. But first, please join me in welcoming today's co-host of Game Mess Mornings, it's Lex Luddy, everybody. Lexi, how are you doing? Grubb, I... This needs to be said. You you should watch Shogun. You should just watch it. Yeah, it's, it's happening. It's a, it it is it is. Uh, I, I've officially decided to watch it. Now it's a matter of actually following through on that decision. Um, I I I have Hulu, which is where I believe I could watch it here in the United States. And uh, I I've been like eyeing it a whole bunch of times. I just haven't had time for it. But uh, it seems real good now for me. Uh, I, it looked cool from the outset, and I was like, "This looks really neat. I, I hope it's good." And then I, I heard the the showrunner, or one of the showrunners, is Justin Marks, who did Counterpart, which is one of my favorite shows. It's got that's the uh, uh, J.K. Simmons. Uh, J yeah, is that, I always mix his name up with J. Jonah Jameson. Uh, J.K. Simmons, uh, a show where he plays two characters from two worlds that got created when someone did like a quantum test and it like split time off and then there was this hallway and you could walk from one world to the other and they would, it, it, it's a whole thing. It's a whole allegory. It's great. It's a great show. Uh, I had two seasons on not Showtime, stars, I think. It, either way, I love that show. It's like a very good show uh, like to watch like during the pandemic as well because it deals with some stuff about that as well. Uh, but I'm like, okay, th they're doing this Shogun show. I'll show up for that. And I also like, apparently it's based on a book that's pretty old. I, 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 I'm like kind of interested in checking out the book as well. So yeah, are, have you watched all the, the episodes so far? Yes, everything that's come out. Um, Anna uh, Siawa, I think is her name. Uh, she was also in Monarch Legacy of Monsters and Pachinko. Right. Um, she is fucking great in it. Uh, and the main dude, Cosmo Jarvis, which is just the most made-up actor name I have ever Absolutely. heard. But I'm, I'm so happy he chose that name when he was getting into acting. Um, he is the most... He's the, he's the British man that I like the most currently in the world. Um, he he, he real, looks a lot like Tom Hardy uh, without, you know, all the Tom Hardy. Yeah, he looks like a mashup between Tom Hardy, Logan Marshall, Green, and like five other white guys with a beard. Um, I, if, if, if I were a director and writer in Hollywood, I would be making a movie where all those guys that look exactly like our brothers and telling a story about that. Oh, yeah. It's like, you, you, that's half the battle right there is, man, those guys do look alike. That rules. Let's make a movie about that. But yeah, I, Cosmo Jarvis incredible name uh i what what's the deal with white people in this show <laughs> like I, I was watching it first i'm like okay, so, yeah tell me yeah so it's it's basically like it opens with like a master and commander fucking black screen and a bit of text which sure. is already like oh hell yes um and it's sesh basically um spain has been in Japan for a while and basically told Japan, hey, we're like the only other continent. Uh, let's trade. Uh, and then this Portuguese vessel shows up and he's like, oh, sorry, other way around. Um, the Portuguese have been there. They've been telling the Japanese that they're the only people there. And then a Spanish vessel shows up uh, with this British pilot on it. Um, and he's like, hey, there's more of the world than like just the Portuguese. Uh, and then war starts happening because shit is also going down in okay. Japan. Um, it's real good. Um, it, 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 I, the, the who are the fo like who are the primary characters? Are they are they the Japanese characters or is it like is, uh, so it, is, it, is it a story about white guys in Japan? Is like what I'm like wondering. No, or Portu so it, Portuguese people in Japan, Hispanic people, I suppose. Yeah, so they all speak English, uh, but when they're speaking English, they're usually in the universe speaking Portuguese okay. because, like, there'll be a Japanese character who understands Portuguese and she'll speak in English with with Cosmo. Um, and so the idea is is that he's one of the main characters, and then it's also one of the um, members of the council. Right before this, the shogunate was dissolved. Right. Um, and so now it's a council leading Japan, and there's a bunch of infighting between the councils. So it becomes a very, not Game of Thronesy, but suddenly there's factions at play. Um, right. 
and they realize like hey maybe having a foreign army might fucking help pretty soon um it's real good it's really good well, I'm going to check it out. I'm, I've been looking forward to like spending some time with it. Maybe I'll make some time this weekend. Make it my workout show, I suppose. We'll see. Um, but you know what? We should explain what we do here. Most weekdays, I, Jeff Grubb, will help piece your gaming life back together. That includes breaking news and maybe even some of our own original reporting. For all these topics, I'll get the input of a bona fide expert who will make me look smart. If you are watching live on Twitch, welcome. You can always listen to the show later on podcast feeds by searching for Game Mess Mornings or find the RSS on GiantBomb.com. You can also catch the show later with chapters and timestamps on YouTube. Hello, YouTube. All right, we have a lot to get into, so let's start the morning mess with... Arika's vice president has shared an image of a mysterious Mega Man design. Uh, there's, there's, there's ins and outs to this story. This is from Chris Scullion at VGC. The vice president of Japanese developer and publisher Arika, who's doing Endless Ocean for Nintendo at that last Nintendo Direct, and they also do like Street Fighter EX in the past, uh, has shared a mysterious image of a previously unseen Mega Man design. As reported by Rockman Corner, Arika vice president Ichiro uh, Mahara was responding on Twitter to a message posted about Mega Man, known as Rockman in Japan, by manga, manga artist Hitoshi Ariga. Ariga has previously worked with Capcom on a number of Mega Man projects, including numerous manga comics. Uh, I used to draw Rockman manga and create uh, encyclopedias and books with Capcom's official artwork, so I know a little bit about Rockman, Ariga wrote, uh, alongside an illustration of Mega Man. Mahara responded, Mahara from Arika, with a post uh, he had redacted himself saying, I used to make Rockman's blank, blank, and blank, and official blank, so I'm a bit familiar with Rockman. This was accompanied by a close-up image of a Mega Man helmet, uh, helmet which has puzzled fans because the design of its paneling, the positioning of a bolt, and Mega Man's glowing eyes don't fit with any previous game in the series. Uh, so basically, this is a new Mega Man design that people have not seen before. Uh, you can see it here if you're watching the video version. Um, now, Mahara was the producer of 2003 GameCube title Mega Man Network Transmission, so some are suggesting it may be unused concept art from, the, from that game. Others believe that Mahara's decision to censor the post may suggest he's teasing a future Mega Man project. Last year, Capcom said that they are trying to investigate and consider how to approach making a new Mega Man game in the future. Uh... This this rings to me as there might be something happening here, uh, and especially because it's Arika. I think Arika is the kind of team that Capcom would approach and say, "Hey, uh, what are you working on? Can you give us some help making a game like this?" What do you think? Yeah, it doesn't seem like something they'd make in house purely because Capcom has bigger money makers at the moment that they would probably put their in house teams to work on uh, first. Maybe this is just uh, more concept art for Mega Man in uh, Exo Primal. Yeah, I mean, that's that's got to be just yeah. the, they need more content for Exo Primal, uh, Capcom wild about that. Um, yeah, I, the, this looking this look of of Mega Man here with the glowing eyes. I'm like, even I'm like, hey, I don't recognize this at all, and I'm not like someone who's consuming all Mega Man content. But it's like, no, this does look like something new, and it is uh, it is very zoomed in. I, I I suppose that like because of the pixelation of zooming in on a JPEG. It's like, yeah, that could be old concept art that you were making for something for the GameCube. Um, but I don't, I guess I don't know why you just don't show the whole thing if that's the case, because that is 21 years ago. You were probably okay to share that that art without breaking any Japanese NDAs at that point. Um, so the, the fact that it's like, it is censored and it is uh, kind of teasing makes it feel like, hey, something is happening here. I, and Capcom is not going to be done with Mega Man, despite all the success with, like, hey, uh, Resident Evil's growing, Monster Hunter's growing, we expect Dragon's Dogma 2 to grow in a big way compared to the first game, and all these things are skyrocketing, and Mega Man not necessarily having that same uh, trajectory necessarily, I think that doesn't mean that Capcom's like, well, we, we abandon anything that's not growing that fast, I think they're like, well, we allocate the appropriate resources to keeping our mascot Mega Man uh, as relevant as possible. And sure, we're not going to like be spend, uh, having our core teams work on a Mega Man game that takes them away from working on one of these other franchises, but that doesn't mean that we're done. I, I, I think a lot of this, these pieces fit together where Capcom doesn't want to be done with Mega Man. Arika is a work for hired studio that has a, and has a, a producer that has a history of working on the franchise. I think they probably make this happen. My question to you, Lexi, is... Uh, 
does Mega Man matter to you as, as a younger gamer? Um, uh, that is a very strong word. Sure, uh, yeah, well, how would you describe it? It's, like, important. Uh, Mega Man's something that, like, you know of if you are into games to any certain extent purely because it's just Mega Man. Um, I don't think when I was young there were any Mega Man games that were, like, catching my eye. Bear in mind that I started playing games around the PS2. Um, and so... I don't think that anyone in that generation has had any big main, mainline Mega Man games that haven't been retro throwbacks. They've all been, you know, Mega Man 8, 8 and 9 were very, or 9 and 10 That's were right. very much so throwbacks to the classics. Um, so I don't know if there's like a young audience for this, but there is an audience for it because people in who are older are still playing games, obviously. I think that like, thing that's kind of exciting about all of this and i only realized the other day is with dragon's dogma 2 coming out we're like finally escaped the whole capcom leak like there's no more games left on that leak as far as i can remember that haven't been announced yet right. so there, now there suddenly... was a Mega Man game on there but i think it was that mobile game that came out a few years ago i think i think yeah, that's how the, uh, what it was the dive something x dive or something um, but yeah, it's interesting that we're now back at, in the place where we don't quite know what Capcom is working on anymore other than like informed guessing. Uh, so who knows? Yeah. And I, I, I think, um, Me Mega Man is, has a sort of Sonic like appeal where I think the character just looks cool. People respond to it. That's why it works so well as a mascot. And I, and people are like, yeah, I still want like the merch and stuff, of course. Um, even if the games aren't the first thing I think of when I think of Mega Man anymore. Um, and that's something that, you know, for a game company, they can play on that. And if they have a, a good idea, could bring that back, get people excited, get people back into the game. I, um, you know, for, for Capcom, their strategy of doubling down on the things that are working is correct. But I think that opens up opportunities for them to take risks here and there. And like smart, you know, relatively safe risks would include... Let's try to do something new with Mega Man again. You know, Mega Man 11, I, I know that internally they weren't thrilled with the performance of that game. Um, but, you know, things change. And if you could deliver something that is, uh, I think, you know, nostalgic and at the same time doing some new stuff with a, either a 2D game or maybe they go the Legends route. I'm not going to try to get the fans of that series' hopes up because they're lunatics. Uh, but, it, you know, maybe something along those lines. I think they could get a big pop um, and get people excited again. And at the very least... It's not going to be something that won't make its money back. It, it'll do that at least. It just might be a s small opportunity cost where it's like, I guess we could have spent that money. We spent uh, uh, partnering with Arika, doing something else that maybe would have made more money. But I think they view it as any investment into Mega Man to keep him, you know, floating up to the surface every once in a while will be worth it in the long run because Mega Man's valuable to them in other ways. I, I think something that's also interesting, I'm just looking at, like, Capcom's announced slate. After Dragon's Dogma 2, the only other game announced from Capcom is Monster Hunter Wilds. So at some point soon, it feels like we're due for Capcom announcing a bunch of other games. Um, Pragma has obviously also announced, but the game isn't real. Yeah, and that's, uh, the, let's not, that's coming out the same time as Deep Down for the PS4. Um, the... The, the, they had a Capcom event like last week and they, they announced stuff like Akuma for Street Fighter. And I, I had no idea this thing even happened until I started seeing uh, like sporadic headlines from that thing. It was an, uh, they, they did a second stream last night with even smaller announcements, just like more. That's where they announced Mega Man for um, for Exoprimal because right. he is coming to Exoprimal. <laughs> wild um i tell you what i'm not looking forward to uh lexi is when they remake resident evil 5 i'm not i don't want to deal with that again uh i played that game in 2021 and you know as someone who defends tank those tank controls like i really i i think that deadly premonition is like a fun game to play in the modern day because of those right. terrible controls um yeah no that game kind of fucking sucks it, um, I, I don't hate Resident Evil 5. I just like there was the, there was the uh the controversy around it where it's like hey you're you're playing as this white guy and you're mowing down all these pe these tribal people in Africa. Boy, that looks pretty racist on its surface and like let's talk about that. And then there was such a backlash of like we how dare you even suggest it's racist and it's like I we're going to do it again 
and it's going to be a nightmare. It's going to be so uh, frustrating. I also just don't think that like that game would benefit a remake as much as some of the other games. Oh, like it's for sure. Yeah. Like it's kind of like remaking six because ultimately the big problem with six is it's just not that engaging. It's over bloated. It, there's way too much in it and it's kind of a fucking mess. Um, yeah, I, I think that there's like interesting things that they still could do with the resident evil franchise. There's zero, there's all those other games that they haven't remade. There's one which could still be remade in the modern sense. Um, yeah, I'm curious if they do decide to go back to five, because I just don't think that game is that interesting in 2023. Yeah, and I, mean, I think they will. I mean, what they they want to keep that gravy train rolling. What choice do they have other than, I mean, I know Code Veronica, stuff like that. That stuff could happen still as well, but they will eventually get to a point where it's like the only thing left to remake is five and six. And I think they will do that. Um, and you're, But you're right. There's, there's, it's just going to have much less of an impact. For one, you know, those games have mixed rep reputations. I think five is a fine game when you're, especially when you're playing a co-op. Um, uh, six though is bad, but you, you know six, they could always they could improve it. Good chapter. Yeah, six has one good chapter, and someone in chat brought this up that they should remake six, but make it only the Leon Kennedy section because that section the is like actually not terrible. Um, it's like a fun action romp, but then by the time you get to the one where it's like, let's do Gears of War, you're like, I, this is fucking miserable. Yeah, and, and you know they could make it a lot better with remakes. So I suppose that's one thing. I, I just, um, I, you know, uh, I think there, there's a, a strong chance that they won't be able to make them that much better. We saw that happen kind of with three a little bit. Uh, now I suppose that could be down to the teams that are working on it. There's a number of factors, uh, but just like hey, five and six inherently are less interesting to me, like you said. Uh, but hey, I'll give them a chance once they come out. Um, uh, Doctor Doctor Ryan in chat just said that six is better than the original four, and I think we should redact his medical license. Yeah, well, uh, I'll, I'll send the board after him. Don't worry, everybody. Yeah. I, I I know what to do with Doctor Ryan. Uh, all right, moving on. Saber Interactive has removed references to Embracer from its site, suggesting it's been sold. This is from Chris Scullion at VGC as well. Uh, Saber Interactive has removed references to Embracer Group from its website, suggesting the reports of its sale are actually accurate. Late last month, a Bloomberg report citing a source familiar with the transaction said the studio was being sold to a group of private investors in a deal worth up to $500 million. At the time, the Saber website featured the studio logo above the words, an Embracer Group company. The site's bio also read, Saber Interactive is a U.S.-based developer and publisher of video games consisting of over 20 studios and more than 2,500 employees worldwide. We are one of the key operati opera operative businesses or um, operative business units of Embracer Group. And I hate when business people just make up terms. Um, however, as noted by uh, Twitter user Li Jun, a, at some point in early March, the site changed to remove references to the Embracer Group with an Embracer Group company message removed from underneath the logo. They, as far as I'm aware, they still have not like publicly confirmed that this has happened. This has all been reporting and now people putting two and two together with what's happening on the website. Um, if I were Saber, I'd be shouting from the rooftops. We don't work for Embracer anymore. Holy shit, we got out. We got out. Look, we, it's possible. You can save yourselves. Um, this is good news for someone. As for me, who's an, a Saber Interactive fan and proud of it, um, I'm, I'm glad that they're able to make this happen. Uh, there is such a stink of death around Embracer uh, that there is a world in which a, a company like Saber just dwindles and falls apart because of Embracer. Uh, I'm glad that they were able to get basically what it sounds like they were able to get private investors to come in, back their bid to buy themselves out from Embracer for around $500 million. And now they are going to take their 20 studios and go out and be independent yet again. Um, and they have a lot of stuff in the works, including apparently still that Knights of the Old Republic remake. Although, again, Sony doesn't seem to want anything to do with it. They're still making it. Um, so, yeah, a lot of stuff still happening over there, including, you know, Expeditions, which I'm, I'm still playing and really enjoying. Uh, but, yeah, this is good news for a, a, a studio and a publisher that has a lot of games in the works. Yeah, I think I'm fascinated by Embracer. I know you are, too, and you've been on this beat uh, as long as I have. But, like, ever since Gamescom 2019 was when it really hit me of, like, oh, Embracer is, like, throwing around money. Um, and you'd see it on the show floor because Embracer owns a bunch of publishers and each one of the publishers would have their own booth on yes. the show floor. And it, by the end of it, 
they were taking up like maybe like just under a quarter of the business space in Gamescom. Like it was ridiculous how much they were spreading out. Um, and as the years have gone on, it's become like this thing of like, hey, do they do they know that they're like the Roman Empire? Do, do, do they know that like this isn't going to last? And I feel like literally everyone has been telling them that it wasn't going to yeah. last. Um, I, I double checked the, the numbers there. Uh, Embracer Bosch Saber Interactive for 525 million euro. Um, the reporting that came out the other week was that Saber bought themselves back for 500 million. Um, yeah. So they're really fucking good at business over there at Embracer. They're yep. really good at maximizing their investments. <laughs> um, and yeah, uh, I would just fucking love to to see someone interview Lars Wingerford because he does it's not never take interviews happen. very often yeah, it's, based on my attempts in the past. Yeah, um, and man, what what Embracer has done should be fucking illegal when you look at it. Like the damage they caused, the way that they so recklessly just bought companies to inflate their value and now they realize like oh we have to make games like oh shit like what and no matter how much those games make no matter how much dead island makes it will never be enough like they have racked up too much debt um right yeah i i get really fucking angry thinking about embracer yeah i mean in in i mean just the uh the picture you painted of a, a game show floor where all these booths are owned by the one company. It's like, clearly we understand at a very basic level how inefficient that is. And it's like, well, you know, it's one thing when all these companies are separate and technically competing and trying to like, you know, get the most attention for themselves. But when you're one big company and you have all these subsidiaries competing with each other for attention, it's the inevitable conclusion for any sane person running that is, Oh, we've messed up here. We could save a lot more if we slim down and and streamlined, and that means cutting a lot of these companies, cutting jobs, and all the uh, all this other stuff that is inherently bad for the industry. So it's like just from the beginning, this was set up as a bad thing, and it only got worse. And we were all like, "Okay, well, Lars, what's the upside here, buddy? Like, what what's the uh, positive? How, how how is this good for anything?" And it was. Well, we look like we're growing. That, that motherfucker in some interview said, uh, not interview, I think he was talking to investors, said some shit like about organic growth and how they're going to continue oh, their organic I was growth. So fucking angry. I fucking... could slap a motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> the least organic growth of any company that what has a ever insane existed. insane thing to say. Uh, the, I think like that became the most apparent when they announced, oh, we're setting up our own PR company and not all of their PR goes through that company. Yep. Like they, the other parts of Embracer Group still hire out other PR companies to do their PR. Why the fuck would you set up an entire PR company and still hire out other companies? Yeah, and it's like, and you know why? Because they're so big. One PR group inside of company would never be able to handle all of the requests and all of the time needed of them. It's like so unwieldy that again, it's just it is self evident how this doesn't work. And, uh, and, you know, you don't have to come listen to this show. You don't have to listen to us talk about these specific incidents. Everyone, everyone's gut reaction from the beginning, every time Embracer picked up something, told them the truth about what was going to happen here. And here we are. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm just glad for the most part that a team like Saber was able to extract themselves. Uh, that's, that's some good news um, at the very least. Oh no, Helldivers has flying bugs to deal with now, or does it? Uh, don't believe all the propaganda. This is from Darren Bonthuse at GameSpot. Helldivers 2 players have a new threat to watch out for following this week's patch as a new breed of terminated enemies have been introduced to the game. While the terminated ground forces live up to their name and terrain, uh, these new bugs are an air airborne menace that have begun appearing in the game. But are they even real? Helldivers 2 director Johan Pilstedt took to Twitter to, uh, to rubbish these claims, rejecting the reality of flying bugs and substituting the own Ministry of Truth approved spin on the claims. I've heard rumors of flying bugs in Helldivers 2, Pilstat wrote. I want to officially refute such preposterous claims. Everyone knows that bugs can't fly, and I'm not alone in thinking this. The Ministry of Truth agrees that this is propaganda from bug sympathizers that want to brainwash good people. Uh, this is a fun game. <laughs> this is so. Uh, I, they can fly now. 
they can fly now. <laughs> um, this is so much fun that they are uh, go, taking this route with like their new features in the game. Uh, it's it's you know kind of it's it's, it's kind of cheesy and hokey a little bit, but in a completely fun and harmless way. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think the 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 more interesting thing about how they're treating it as a live service is it isn't like they're not doing seasons. They're just doing, hey, this week we're adding one thing, we're adding a couple of weapons, we're adding a... Like, it's a trickle to the realistic extent that I've ever seen with a live service game where it does feel like things are, like, arriving right on, like, as they're done being manufactured within the universe, and they're building that into it. And I think it's keeping people engaged way more than you've seen with other seasons because people arrive for the first week when there's a new Fortnite season, and then they drop off once they realize, oh, I'm never fucking completely in this battle pass yeah uh, but if there's always a new thing to check out it's a, and it's an evolution of the of the kind of live service storytelling slash content drops that we've gotten from other games but done in a really cohesive and fun way like, i mean fortnite's like evolving map was always something that people like early on you know, people have their, their problems with it these days but early on it was like man that, that they got rid of this whole town and replaced it with something else we gotta go check that out and see what that's like and you know, there was not, there wasn't a ton of lore reasons early. Excuse me, early on, they they added some stuff later, but it was never as interesting or uh, in world truthful as this is. And then there's like stuff like Hitman uh, 2016 and 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 its sequels, where they would have all these live service things like here's an elusive target, and it's like that stuff never had the connective tissue of here's why this this new target is here. Um, here's how it fits into the story. Uh, here's like what's happening in the wider lore. All that stuff, and it's like well, that would have been very cool, but I get why that's also difficult. So them coming in it with this, it doesn't feel like a roadmap. Like when right. Destiny comes out, it's it's kind of weird that like oh, the big event always happens once every six month, right. months. Um, I do think something that's worth highlighting. Um, and Diego uh, over at Polygon wrote uh, wrote a fantastic piece on this about how the bit of in the way that they're treating a lot of their communications in an in world sense has had a adverse effect on the community in some circumstances and has limited their ability to actually like moderate their community in quite a serious way and yeah. um, it's a really interesting read because on one hand this like in-universe stuff it's fun and it's really good on the other hand there are people who don't fucking get that it's satire still and by playing into that they're feeding a lot of the people who don't get that like this game is mocking the fascists and so you've had situations where there are groups of players who are becoming emboldened by their toxicity because they see the developers essentially approving it by staying in character. It's kind of like the Warhammer effect yes. where you have a bunch of fans who are like, oh, no, th these guys are fucking great because the Warhammer company is like always promoting them and like they love them and they don't realize like, oh, wait, no, maybe God Kings are bad. Yeah, it's it's definitely play with fire a little bit. I think that it's important to point that out because this could, you know, turn on a dime and suddenly, yeah, there is uh, these people role playing or actually being kind of fascisty, you know, fashy and and uh, uh, towards other players and then towards the developers and they, like you said, feel emboldened. That is definitely something that could burn out the, the studio really quickly. And, you know, a couple of years from now, it's like, why did they stop doing that? And then we look back at the history. It's like all these new stories of either you know, harassment or people not just getting it or players treating other players poorly, which is something that does happen a little bit with like the um, uh, people being kicked. If they're not properly if they don't have the proper meta spec for their character and they join a certain like leveled mission, uh, the, the other people be like, well, you're not you don't have the right gun. So we're going to kick you. And yeah. the studio's and like, hey, we don't, we don't know how to deal with this. We, we need help figuring this out. And it's like, eventually, I think they're going to get to a point where they've learned that uh, the community is not going to be helpful with solutions. Even if they're point, this is a problem, they don't know what the solution is. And if you're looking to the community to help you with that, especially one that you're like keep, keeping on a, a string with, with this lore, it's like, yeah, they could step in it in a bad way and it could burn them out. Yeah, I think that. It's something that other companies have learned the very hard way. Bungie definitely learned it. Bungie like, is hey, definitely one, yes. Yeah, like community management and community uh, development is a core part of being a developer with a live service game. It's important. And if you don't have a healthy relationship that also like puts boundaries on like where the community can and can't step, like you wind up with straight up, you know, 
these relationships where the community basically decides they're making the game as much as the developers um and things can get toxic very quickly um yeah i i think that hell divers is fucking awesome i really like playing it uh, i just worry that there are parts of it that they have like it seems like they're shocked by the success by it as well and when something breaks out as big as that there's always an element of like okay people are going to interpret this in the worst possible way um and you lose control of your art once you put it into the world and that's kind of what's happening here is they're they're losing control of their art um so yeah i really hope that they can keep their community they they can keep their community moderated and positive in a way that keeps that like role playing going and is fun but also doesn't entertain dipshits yep agreed all right we are going to take a quick break when we get back we have a lot more headlines to get into right after this All right, we are back, and let's head right back into it. Uh, actually, first, um, uh, apparently the, uh, the House of Representatives just voted to ban TikTok, so that's fun. Um, I, um, I, if you're, people have a hard time convincing me that this is anything other than if you were to search the term capitalism on TikTok, you get a lot of people telling you why it's bad, and I think that's just, uh, yeah, they're frightened of its ability to sway people and, and their opinion. Um, obviously, there's bad sides the tiktok of course but it's not worth banning i, I hope I it's just freedom I, yeah yep. i i love freedom so much um, yep. um but don't worry bobby Kotick's gonna buy it and save uh -huh. it because uh -huh. uh, he, he has such a good relationship with all the american senators i'm sure uh he'll be able to smooth talk them once he buys it uh also the finals too did uh, get, announce its new season it has private matches and yeah maybe we'll return for, to that for tnt at some time uh that would be fun i would like to check that out uh, all right, here's the next headline. Unicorn Overlord physical copy sold out at retail in Japan. This is from Aiden at My Nintendo News. Atlas, the publish publisher of Unicorn Overlord, recently announced that physical copies of the game have sold out at retail stores across Japan. Released worldwide on March 8, 2024, the game has seen an overwhelming response from fans leading to a sudden shortage of physical copies. In a statement addressing the shortage, Atlas expressed its apologies for any inconvenience caused by the sold-out status of Unicorn Overlord. The company also conveyed its deep gratitude for fans for their overwhelming support. Um, I, I, this is a combination of things, Lexi. Obviously, they probably did not print a ton of phys physical copies. It was probably difficult to predict how well this was going to do. And then also, I think demand is significantly higher uh, than they would have even re like expected on the high end. Uh, I remember we, we, earlier this week, we did a poll. Hey, are you going to play Unicorn Overlord? And this is not like you don't have to put any money down to vote yes on that. But almost half of respondents said yes. Uh, and that it's like way, way more of a response than I was expecting for that game. And I think it's coming down to strong word of mouth, great reviews, uh, Vanillaware having a good reputation among developer or among gamers, and the game just kind of like filling a niche that's like, hey, it's it's different and 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 familiar at the same time. It's like you know this turn-based strategy kind of thing, but it's got auto battles, and, and and I think it's like, okay, well, I'm going to get in there and just experience something new. I think it has a ton of mechanics people haven't seen before, and then of course it just looks really nice. Yeah, you're, you're a great industry analyst, but I'm kind of surprised that you have forgotten the most major factor in yeah, all of this. What's that? Gamers be horny. Yeah, the mommies. Yeah. There's uh, mommies they're, they're in real, it. They're real fucking horny for, for the characters in that game. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean that's that's just that's true across the all Vanillaware games, uh, and I think they're embracing that here as well. Um, yeah, the, the M in chat for mommies. Uh, I, I am I have not touched this game yet. I, I will. It's um, I keep forgetting it's not on PC, so I'm always like, what is that new game I wanted to play? And I'm like checking the Steam store. I'm like, ah, nothing new has come out. What, what, what I must be making it up. And I'm like, oh yeah, I got to go get on the Steam or the uh, Switch to actually play this game, uh, which I, I suppose I will do. Uh, but but yeah, I, I'm. Hey, this game is do. They're gonna do way better than what seems like any previous Vanillaware game. Um, a big part of that is gonna be the the power of the Switch uh, driving the the excitement for that game a little bit. But also, I think it's just like this is the right game at the right time, and horniness has never been more popular. Atlas are having a big year between this Persona and uh, Metaphor Re Fantasio. They have like three games that could sell really fucking well this year. Um, which will only embolden them to be more weird. Yeah, that's, that's what we need. Uh, yes, absolutely. 
Uh, all right, we could be getting Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, Rebirth's Queen's Blood expansions. This is from George Yang at GameSpot. Square Enix is open to expanding Queen's Blood, the in-game card game in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. The minigame has been incredibly popular and well-received. There are 145 cards in total, reads a quote. We haven't decided anything in terms of future development for Queen's Blood, said director Naoki Hamaguchi uh, in an interview with Red Bull. <laughs> uh, but so far, the media who played it have provided very positive feedback on it, so we want to consider further expansions as a possibility. Real quick, I love that, like, in this world where uh, um, media companies are closing, Red Bull's still doing their gaming stuff. I'm glad that that's still not... I'm glad that's yeah. not been shuttered yet. That's something. Um yeah, hey, Queen's Blood. I like Queen's Blood a ton. It's like the, my favorite mini game in uh, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Uh, I think it could stand alone very easily, and I think that they should expand it and do a ton of fun stuff. I don't know if they should necessarily expand it within the confines of Re of a Rebirth, though. Uh, that I don't know how that would work necessarily. But if it's like if they make that like something you could play, I guess if you could boot it up from the menu and just start playing games uh, fr from Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, and you could get booster packs there i think i would be down um but as it stands it's like i'm i'm not looking for them to like hide a character in the world i gotta go talk to that will now suddenly show up and sell me more inside the world of final fantasy 7 rebirth yeah i'm super torn uh because i beat final fantasy 7 remake the other week uh and i did not enjoy the back half of that game um i thought it was straight up pretty bad um, but every time I hear something about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, I'm like, maybe I should, like, give it, make, I've bought it, I know I'm gonna play it at some point, but then I hear, like, one thing that's like, oh, I'm really gonna like this, I'll lose a bunch of time to Queen's Blood, and then I hear something else where it's like, oh yeah, it gets even more, like, bullshit and more, like, nonsense towards the end, I'm like, oh, that doesn't sound like a great use of 60 hours for me. Yeah, uh Right. Um, I think like if that stuff is something that you're worried about, I think Dan's strategy of playing until you're done is because there, there's a great game in there. Uh, there's a lot yeah. of fun stuff. So uh, I, I think you probably will know when you're done. Uh, and and that's a completely valid way to play that game. I think um, I I'm not going to let it discourage me too much, although upcoming games like Dragon's Dogma 2 and and some other stuff is going to probably pull me away a little bit. Um, but like, I want to, I do want to get back to more Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. I did, I was playing that this morning a little bit. Um, I was actually just trying to like get used. I had, I hadn't played it really since uh, the stream. I'm like, how do I open up the map? So that's where I'm at with that game yeah. now, uh, which is always frustrating, but, uh, I'll, I'll give it another shot. But yeah, I, I think that like there, like stuff, stuff like Queen's Blood is worth experiencing and you could set the story aside, uh, at least especially how it ends, because characters are great. The The world is great. I think the uh, the way it looks is fantastic. I think the open world is really well done. It's like a, one of the better RPG open worlds. Um, so yeah, I think it's still worth getting in there and checking out. Yeah, I, I do think that like the thing that stuck out most to me about Final Fantasy VII Remake was how much I enjoyed the first half where I was just hanging out with these characters and I was yeah. getting to know them. And I was like, oh, they made these like characters who I've only known through memes and references for all these years like super likable and i actually care about them and then when it became more of an overarching end of the world plot towards the end i was like i care a bit less about this i'd just like to hang out with these cool dudes and do that's yep i and i yeah again i think that's a completely fine way to experience that game uh let's see wwe 2k24 feature has players uploading porn yet again to the game this is from Luis we won. Joshua we won, Gutierrez at GameSpot. WWE 2K24 launched last week, but in the game's community creation sub, some players are already up, up to their old tricks. The new Create a Sign feature allows users to create, the sh create and share custom signs for audience NPCs to hold during matches. Instead of having signs with the usual WWE banter on them, some players are uploading sexually explicit images. It's worth noting that there is a system that allow, allows players to flag content as inappropriate if you're a goddamn narc. Uh, but despite that, many of them have made their way to the top of the most downloaded and most upvoted pages. Some images are featured prominently despite even being days old, making it unclear whether the flagging system is unreliable or if players just aren't flagging them in the first place. Uh, WWE 2K is rated T by the ESRB, but wrestling games are often played by younger kids, and in any event, the sexually explicit content exceeds even an M rating. 
Having adult content in WWE games isn't new. In the past, some players used the game's create a logo feature to upload sexually explicit images that would make their way to the top of the most downloaded and most upvoted pages, according to Reddit threads that are sometimes months or even years old. Yeah. Uh the online games, especially with create uh, uh, user created aspects, are the wild west. It's definitely the kind of thing where uh, if you are a parent of a kid, you gotta you just gotta be watching that, or not even letting the kids engage with that stuff in the first place, because it is it's not really part of that t that rating. That T rating is it really has nothing to do with what is going to happen once you go online. That is a whole it, other world. It goes back to what we were talking about earlier, like jobs i would not like to have community management for a live service game uh running a twitter account for a brand and working for the wwe right now and this combines <laughs> all of those and it just seems like a fucking nightmare of trying to manage that like how many fucking vinces have people created and uploaded to that already oh, do you want to bash yes like yes. it's probably just a fucking nightmare on there I mean, that, I saw, that always happens. Like, Chris Benoit, I think, is, like, always one of the most created characters that people download and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's there's a long history of that sort of thing. Yeah, and I saw Alex over at Next Lander was playing it, and this, like, fucking thumbnail for it was just Peter Griffin. I, and I was like, okay, yeah, this this game's still this. This is still what people do every time. It's the me-verse. They just create Peter Griffin. Like, okay. Yep. And, uh, and that's, I mean... It's uh, the Wild West, and it's uh, there's going to be porn on there, but it's also the best part of the game. <laughs> all the all the user created stuff and messing around with, with the creativity features uh, and telling your own stories, um, and you know setting up matches with that are impossible. And like you know, the game facilitates that to a certain extent. Like Dan was talking about having Muhammad Ali uh, uh, fighting. Uh, God, I can't remember who it was now, but it was like yeah, it was like, yeah, the, the, like these dream matches. And it's like well, you could do that with the characters that they give you. But obviously, they know that the creator wrestler and sharing those creations is important because it's it, it, these things are downloaded tens of thousands of times, and they do enable even wilder matches of like Ultraman fighting Al Gore or whatever. Yeah. And that's like, that's a ton of fun. Ultimately, we joke about this, but like I would be devastated if they ever removed this like oh, system yeah. because you look at like what kind of fun you do you look at like dead meat has been doing one for horror movie characters yep. and like those are really fucking fun they're really dumb and really fun uh germa used to do ones on twitch that would get like thousands of viewers watching live that were just fucking ridiculous like yeah i would be it's some of the best stuff in that game because it is the most player driven thing that you can do in that game yeah it's um it, it, you're you're right like if, if this went away and it's like there's always the risk of that with, with with things like this and that's why the moderation is so important you got to keep things on the up and up you have to keep things uh, sort of cool uh, because it could ruin it for everybody um and you're never going to be able to stop some idiot kid uploading a picture of a butthole to a sign creator in wwe uh, you're not gonna be able to stop that so what you have to do is you have to then up uh, Cut it off, you know, cut it off as soon as possible so it doesn't spread. Uh, and don't take that literally. Uh, so, so that you don't have more of that everywhere, and then you start attracting unwanted attention for people being like, "We can't have this. Someone needs to do something." Uh, the only thing that's left is to have the United States House of Representatives end WWE's create a wrestler mode, uh, which you know you could easily get to. That's the kind of thing that w w that, that creates moral panics all the time. So you kind of want to get on top of this if you're 2K and stop the buttholes. Uh, the it, latest. It, sorry, I, I just wanted to make sure there was a clean read on that final line. Yeah, of course. Yeah, this is just it's a good show, everybody. It's a good show. You don't have to tell me it's a bad show. I know it's a good show. The latest PS5 system update adds DualShock improvements, and it also lets you dim the console light. This is from Chris Scullion at VGC. Shout out to Chris for all the hard work. Uh, the, this, the version 9.0 firmware update improves the volume of the controller speakers. It also uses AI machine learning to improve the quality of the controller microphone, which is, don't improve that thing. Don't encourage people to use that stupid microphone. It, 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 disable so it permanently. Yeah. Just, like, get rid of it, please. Get it's... rid of it. The amount of times that I've like joined into multiplayer games and it's just someone who has not never turned that thing off. With, like, doesn't know it's there. Fucking, yeah, fucking red hot chili peppers playing in the background. <laughs> Their child is crying and you can hear them eating chips all the time. And it's like, 
Oh man, fucking video games! What a mistake. Uh huh. Red Hot Chili Peppers being called as the boomer band of the uh, of the guy that doesn't know how to turn off the microphone. It's harsh but fair, Lexi. You're absolutely yeah. right. Uh, I, I, I yeah. So they're gonna improve the sound quality of that. I, I please just use a headset if you actually are gonna talk online, everybody. Please. Um, there's a whole bunch of other additions, but yeah. I mean, hey, I, I guess mostly with this, I'm wondering like. Do you think the the PS5 like user interface and and menu system and all that stuff is is uh good? I'm still like no, whenever I use that thing, no, I still kind of hate, hate it. it. I, I fucking hate it. Hate it. So, so I I've been visiting my parents a lot recently, and my PS4 is there. And loading up the PS4 and using that again, I'm like, this is just so much fucking better. Like it's not that much different, but it's just more intuitive in every right. single fucking way. And also like everything in the PS5. UI is designed to annoy the shit out of me. Specifically, if you go to the PlayStation Plus games and you subscribe to their tier that gives you the retro games, they'll have a thing that's like sort by release date, but it's not actually fucking release date. It's when they added them to PSN. So yeah. you have PS2 titles that are They're bad at as it. fucking. Yeah, they have PS4 and PS2 titles that are sorted as newer than PS4 and PS3 titles. I fucking hate it. It's just... It's not that fucking hard. It's not that hard. It's wild that they do things that way. I, for me, it's like... Uh, I could just see so transparently through what happened here. They... This is the PS5 interface is basically built on top of the PS4 interface. They took that and they slapped a bunch of shit on top to make it feel new and different for, you know, for obsolescence reasons that we always talk about. And it's just like, okay, we're past that period. You should start peeling away some of this horse shit and just going back to what you had with the PS4. <laughs> it was like, that just worked. This doesn't, uh, this is annoying. Um, and I, but it, uh, you know, it's, it's never going to be the thing that stops people from buying the games, right? So this is not like a priority for them to fix. And yet, boy, I wish they would. I wish they would just take a little bit of time to make it less shitty. Um, I, I just know there's like UX designers who every time you bring up the fact that they swapped the way that you hold down the button or press the PlayStation button to shut down the console, like, who fucking decided that? Who was like, let's just invert it from yep. one game to another, like, or from one console to another? Who Jesus Christ. Even the stuff that was cool, like when it launched, uh, like being able to keep track of whether I want, want to play inverted in every game. Like the PS5 launched and it's like, we're going to like have something set across all your games. That just stopped working. That just stopped yeah. working at some point. And I got to go into every game and invert my controls again and, and uh, set my stuff to performance mode instead <laughs> of graphics mode. I mean, may, I guess I'll, I'll go back and check. Maybe that stuff got turned off, but I'm pretty sure it's on I, last time I checked. And it's still some games are like, yeah, we're not. We don't give a shit but, about that. Because it came up on content, I went back and I've been playing Sackboy on the PS5 because I played it on PC when I reviewed it. Um, and uh, I was, like, fucking shocked when one of those game cards came up and it was like, pick up your activity when uh -huh. you're going. And then I finished the level and it was like, review the challenge. Like, how yeah. many stars out of five <laughs> would you give this? I was like, what the fuck are these notifications? I think I went to a, a game card in a recent game uh, or tried to go to a game card and, like, like a, like I clicked it and it was basically the PlayStation Five equivalent of like four oh four not found. It's like we don't know what you're trying to do. This is not connected yeah. to anything. This is just a box that exists here. I'm like, oh okay. Uh, I mean, it, and it's what we all kind of predicted. It's like yeah, these it's things. What these, was things saying. these things are cool if they're going to use it, but we know they're not. <laughs> we yeah. all said that at the beginning, and here we are. Uh, whatever. It, it doesn't. Once you're in the games, it's fine. They play great. PlayStation Five is a good console. Uh, but I'm. More and more appreciative of Xbox not changing things and be like, listen, our shitty thing is kind of, you're kind of used to it, right? So just keep using the shitty thing and we'll make it a little bit better here and there. Uh, as opposed to, like, let's just spend, remix everything because we're we PlayStation. We spent so long trying to make the Xbox One's UI fucking usable. And we're just about there. We are not starting from square one again. Uh, Nylock says ranking of console UI. I, I would do a tier list of console I, UIs. Yeah, I would be way into that. That sounds incredible. All right, we'll find some time on a BCR in the future for that. Uh, okay, let's see here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are David Bowie. There's a, just straight up a David Bowie song, uh, Let's Dance, in Sackboy, and the level is set to the music, and it's incredible. And then you go to the next level, and it's an instrumental version of uh, Like a Virgin by Madonna, 
without it. So and, that, that, and that's like, that's just as good. It's such a yeah. good game. The, there's, there's the level with Toxic as well. Yeah. It's like that, that game is really annoying to me in one way because I, when I play it, I'm like, oh, this game is like so close to being a nine out of 10. And then I remember that if you get hit twice, you die and you have to go back to a checkpoint. I'm like, this is really annoying. Yep. Why is, why are you I so- I wish they had like, an ultra easy mode for my kids, for sure. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, it's close. It, it, it's really close to being great. And if they had just like, were, I don't know, if they had just taken a few different approaches to balancing, I think the movement in that game actually feels super good. Um, yes. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's not quite Super Mario World in terms of quality, but it's like the closest thing from that anyone else has ever made. And uh, the needle drops, the very illumination animation style uh, needle drops are better than they are in any illumination movie. Uh, it's, so yeah, I, I think they just did a great job with making that game feel fun and alive. And the kids really do love it. And she's passed out. All right, cool. She's, she's mad at me and now she's sleeping. Uh, all right, Resident Evil 4 has sold 7 million copies. This is from Jonas Mackey at Game Reactor. Uh, it was the remake everyone was asking for, and almost exactly a year ago, Capcom finally released com a completely reworked Resident Evil 4. The predecessor is often considered one of the best games of all time, and that legacy has preserved and improved, leading to great ratings and satisfied fans when it was released in March 2023. In just two days, 3 million copies were sold, within, and within a week, 4 million games had been sold. Since then, it has continued to grow, and recently an Apple version was launched. Has anyone played that version? I just, I think it's an insane thing to buy that game on your iPhone and have it take up half of your storage on your phone, but whatever. Um, $70. In, uh, for $70, yeah. Uh, but the game has now surpassed 7 million copies sold, which is, I think that's like right in the range where that's a huge success for th these games. Uh, Resident Evil uh, in the past, it's like some of the best games uh, before this like spat of remakes were right around 7 million. I think that's what Resident Evil 6 did, um, which is uh, unfortunate that that was the best selling one for a very long time. Um, and then this game's probably gonna continue to sell. I guess it gets more sales it's going to easily get over to 10 million, I think, uh, in the next couple of years. So that's pretty good. I, and I think it's, 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 you know, they're going to be very happy with that. Are you surprised by that number? Would you expect more? What do you think? No, I fucking love the Resident Evil games at the moment. I really wanted to talk shit about Resident Evil 4 just to upset Mike, but I love that game too much. Yes, um, yep. <laughs> I, I do think Resident Evil is like one of my favorite gaming franchises at this point. It's hitting. Uh, it just hits, it, it hits every note. Yeah, looking at the sales for OE2 remake, the latest numbers on that were like 12.6 million. Um, so this is going to keep selling. Um, I think that it's just a really fucking well-made game. It's yep. like everything about it is designed really cleverly. It like feels really good to play, and they made really sensible changes to both the story and the gameplay. Yep, that's right. Uh, and... Uh, it's it's getting the sales it deserves, and uh, I think Resident Evil will just keep getting bigger. Um, the way that they're making these games and the quality coming out of Capcom right now, they're just they're nailing it, and Resident Evil Four is, is benefiting from that. And uh, one of these days, they'll figure out how to turn it into a movie. One of yeah, these attempts. That seems impossible. Uh, all right, last story here. A new Nintendo Switch emulator has a few tricks up its sleeve to avoid getting sued. This is from Alex Hopley at Game Reactor. A Yuzu, the most popular Switch emulator out there, recently shut down, and already we are seeing another emulator take its place. Do you know what it's called? Cleverly, Sue You. <laughs> Sue You is looking to avoid a similar loss. It's the giant bomb naming scheme. What's the dumbest fucking thing we can call this thing? Uh, Sue You is looking to avoid a similar lawsuit from Nintendo and is preparing to utilize some legal loopholes to get around one. Uh, Sue Yu is currently uh, currently exists in a legal gray area, and we are trying to work out uh, work our way out of. Discord moderator Sharpie told as our excuse me Ars Technica, uh, there are multiple plans and possibilities for what to do next. Things are still being organized and planned, uh, but the general plan is to avoid promoting piracy. They're not going to include official tutorials on how to download copyrighted games, and they will not monetize. That seems to be so their big the thing. So here's the plan. Here's the plan. We don't commit crimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We like read the DMCA and then don't do those things. Yeah, that, that seems to be it. I, honestly, Yuzu, again, the, the emulator itself, even when Nintendo was suing it, they're not saying you can't build an emulator. It was ne the, never the emulator. It was bypassing encryption. It was explaining how to bypass uh, uh, you know, the copyright law, things like that, that Nintendo was going after. That's what they built their case on. Um, 
And if you can avoid those things, like many emulators do, you should continue to be fine. So sue you. Uh, look out for that at a uh, shady place on the internet near you. Um, what, what an incredible name. All right, Lexi, I have a poll question I'm going to get to while I get that set up. Why don't you tell people where they can find you, what you have going on, all that good stuff. Yeah, so you can find me all over the place at the moment. Uh, I'm on startmenu.co.uk, a website for young people trying to break into the industry as game journalists. Uh, we try to have like a safe and supportive place for people to find opportunities and to get working with an editor and get their work out there. Um, you will also be able to find me on Shack News over the next couple of weeks. Uh, there is a game summit on in Galway that I will be attending um, and interviewing a few people, Ash. Uh, so you can see my write-ups from that sometime early April. Um, and you can see me around the place in the giant bomb trash, annoying people with my own emote now. Uh, and let's get some Lex wins in chat for that. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I'm really, uh, I'm discovering I'm really good at Superman 64. Oh, really? You, yeah. you always win. I always win. It's... <laughs> well, we'll get into more of that here in a second. Let's see. Let's do this poll question. Uh, all right. Did you ever play an Adult Swim game? 53% said yes. 47% said no. Uh, adult Swim games, I real soft spot for them. I just, every time they were putting out anything, I was like, I'm at least interested. Uh, they were the team I would seek out whenever I was at any sort of indie gaming event uh, at, a, at a show. Uh, because I knew they would find something that had like an attitude, and that's what I—that's like the thing I prize the most from an indie game. Lex is give me something with a voice, give me something that's like screaming at me in some way. And Adult Swim games always did that. Um, I, if someone knows a way to play Unicorn or, or uni, yeah, Unicorn Rainbow Attack—is that what it's called? Rainbow Unicorn Attack. If someone knows how to play that original one still somewhere, um, let me know. I would appreciate that. I want to track that down. My kids, I think, would really dig that. That does remind me, quick shout out to my old co-worker, Andy Kelly, uh, who used to work at The Gamer and now Robot works at Unicorn Devolver. Uh, he now works at Devolver, but he's been doing like SNES style manuals for all their games coming up. So he did one for Pepper Grinder and he did one for Children of the Sun and they look fucking great. Like they, yeah. they're real cool. Um, so yeah, th those indie game studios that have a bit of money behind them or publishers that have a bit of money behind them and were funding weird shit. There's not enough of them, and it's a real fucking enough. shame that there's less every every month. Uh, fuck WB. Uh, let's see. Uh, next poll question. Is Mega Man important? Yes or no? You can vote on that right now by going to youtube.com slash at Giant Bomb. Uh, under the community tab there, you will find our poll questions. Uh, I will talk about this on Game Mess Mornings here on Giant Bomb tomorrow. That's where we'll discuss the results. Speaking of Giant Bomb, later today... It's Blight Club with Super Dan 64, the Dan of Steel. It's, um, it's going to be a big moment for him. He has to decide because Mike did go back and beat Shinnok for shoot in Mortal Kombat Mythology Sub-Zero. Mike is number nine in the world if his speedrun gets accepted. Um, he is a sick, sick man. Uh, but his sickness uh, has effects. It affects us all, mostly Dan, though, who um, agreed to beat the game on Superman difficulty, the highest difficulty, to see all the to see the shoot credits, uh, if Mike beats Shinnok, well, that's happened. Now Dan is into Superman sixty four. He has to decide if he wants to take the chance of playing it on the normal difficulty and then just playing the last level on the Superman difficulty to see if that works. Which someone said, but we don't know if that's the case, or if he was going to restart the whole game right now and play it on Superman difficulty. So tune in for that. You're not going to want to miss it. As always, Blake Club is going to be so much fun. Um, do you I mean, do you think? Dan is more of a Zack Snyder Superman or more of a James Gunn Superman, or is he more of a uh, Reeves Superman? I, he, yeah, he's he's a mix between a Snyder and a Richard Donner Superman. Yeah. So, like, did Richard Donner was an, uh, uh, actually, w like, went to prison for a little bit, right? I got to look into that. I can't remember why he went to jail. Uh, I think that's right, though. Uh, so, yeah. So, a criminal director and a real criminal director in Zack Snyder. No, no lock in chat said he's more of George Reeves. Uh, no, no. I don't want to, <laughs> let's not do that. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, he's a Brandon Ralph. He's a, a, a Ralph Superman. Um, yeah. And if you missed that first episode, go watch it right now so you're ready. Because uh, some fun stuff happened in there. Uh, and that continues to be one of my favorite franchises that we got going over here at Giant Bomb. Lexi, 
Once again, once again, you've won. Thank you so much for spending today with me talking about video games. I really appreciate it. Anytime, anytime. Thank you all for watching as well. You're the best audience in gaming. Till next time, have a good one. Take care of yourselves and goodbye. Thanks for being cool too. Appreciate it, everybody.